Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Crosshair 8 Impact from Asus ROG. So, this right here is basically like a top 2 X570 motherboard for me. And I say top 2 because I wouldn't necessarily choose this over the, over the Gigabyte X570 Extreme, but I do still think this is an extremely cool motherboard. So, uh, let's get into it, shall we? So, yeah. Um, we're gonna start off with all the different overclocking features this comes with because, like, it is a mini DT. Like, actually, we're not gonna worry about the form factor. Just overclocking features, right? Like, the form. You can see the form factor with your own eyes. You can make your own opinions on that. I, I don't really care for like space savings, right? Like, I'm a huge fan of EATX boards, so. Anyway, um, the first sort of noteworthy overclocking feature is we do have some troubleshooting LEDs up here. Those are color-coded, um, which is especially useful when you have them jammed right up against each other like this, because if they were all one color and one of them lights up, you're not going to have any idea what's actually wrong, because you're going to try to look at that, and the LED being lit up is going to blind you, so you're not going to be able to tell which one actually lit up. There, there's a lot of motherboards that make that mistake, so I do appreciate that Asus does have this color-coded. Also, it means that you can just glance over and tell from the color what, what's going on instead of worrying about which which position is lighting up. Um, we got a power button right here, which is kind of just randomly in the middle of the board because, well, unfortunately, it is too small, right, being a, a, a mini DTX motherboard, so there's just not really a good amount of space for optimizing the layout of your various functions. Down here we got the sort of LN2 overclocking corner of the motherboard as well as some SATA ports. Uh, we get a slow mode switch right here. We have a retry button, safe boot button. So this is basically brute force your way for, through memory training. This is for uh, getting into the BIOS if you if you screw up the settings and you don't want to and you didn't you forgot to save a profile. So this is a really re really helpful button. Um, um, though I have heard apparently there's some issues with uh, safe boot functionality on LN2 because of how AMD's BIOS works now. So yeah, like. That so yeah, but I, I don't have any personal experience in it. Ambient sa safe boot is a really great uh, great function to have. Um, then we have an LN2 mode jumper right here, right? You can see how that's traced out. So the LN2 mode on Asus motherboards, on some of them, it preloads a bunch of voltages. I think on X5, like X470, it does that. On X570, I think it also does that. But the bigger thing is it uh, removes uh, voltage restrictions, which I'm really not a fan that, like, if you want to, because the thing is, you might want to do stupid memory voltage even on ambient cooling. It's not advisable, but, you know, I do that. Uh, <laughs> and the thing is, is if you enable LN2 mode, because it sets a bunch of extreme overclocking voltages, you then have to go and manually reverse all of the things LN2 mode does for you um, if you're at ambient because it causes all kinds of issues. Like, for example, in Z390, uh, if you enable LN2 mode, your temperature readings are completely wrong because it screws with the, one of the voltages that actually uh, affects the, the temperature readings from, from the CPU. So, yeah, I'm really not a fan that Asus has the LN2 mode jumper do, you know, both control voltage restrictions and set a bunch of voltages. I think the the setting a bunch of LN2 voltages should be its own, like another jumper or maybe a switch. But uh, still, like it, you know, it, it does like, it's, it's a fringe complaint for me, right? Because it's like not that many people actually are going to care about the fact that LN2 mode does what it does because most people don't need more than two volts memory voltage at ambient and more like basically like the LN2 mode with the voltage restrictions it imposes is like for, you basically go from unsafe for long-term use to uh, voltage is high enough to immediately kill the CPU if you feel like doing it, right? So uh, that not really like my complaints about the LN2 mode are really irrelevant to most people. It's just like, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of having a fun, like having it multi-purpose like that. But, you know, especially on a board like this, there's just not that much space to add other, like, more switches and that kind of thing. So, anyway, do, we do get the LN2 mode jumper uh, right there. Then over here, we have a hole in the CPU socket for putting K-type thermocouples through so that you can monitor the temperature of the CPU when it's on liquid nitrogen, because obviously the built-in temperature sensors, they don't tend to work below zero degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, that basically means, well, if you want to check your thermal paste condition, you, you need to stick a probe onto the back of the CPU. Um, that's Well, the other option is to, like, drill a very small thermocouple hole into the IHS. And it's just, like, for most 
m most people that is not really a viable option, right? So th this is much more uh, a much much easier way to deal with that is to just stick the the K type thermocouple to the back of the CPU, and that's what that hole is for. Uh, what else was there? Right. Um, I guess we can also mention that Asus is still, so this right here is basically an op amp uh, that, um, well, it's actually multiple op amps to it, together in one chip. But the main point of this is um, that uh, Asus basically takes the voltage reading from the die sense and they replicate it to the voltage read points, which I'm not sure if this, actually this board doesn't have any voltage read points because it's just so freaking small, so there's not, not enough space for them. But on other boards, this would actually replicate the voltage to your uh, voltage read points, because normally your voltage read points are actually hooked up somewhere in the middle of the CPU socket, which basically means you're measuring the voltage before the resistance of the CPU socket itself. So, you know, it screws with the measurement a bit. Um, and the other thing is it replicates the die sense voltage for the super IO chip. Now on AMD, this really isn't that useful a feature because there's the SVI2 TFN sensor. And that's, you know, a sensor built directly into the CPU that's very, very accurate. And it, it is accessible to, to hardware info and all kinds of software. But on Intel platforms, this is actually really useful because on Intel platforms, getting access to the on die sense uh, voltages is a... Well, it's not very convenient uh, for most software to do it. In fact, if you don't implement something like what Asus is doing here, you're basically stuck getting the voltage reading either from the controller or you're just stuck with the... Like, well, basically, the Super I.O. can't actually get the voltage reading from the controller. Like, that's the main issue. So you, you need to... Like, like, on Intel, this is far more useful, is basically what I'm getting at, who, right? Um, for, for reasons that we're not going to go into too much depth on. So... Yeah, anyway, so we do have that for the basically upgraded voltage uh, uh, sort of monitoring capabilities in software. And then on the rear I.O., they did manage to somehow squeeze a postcode onto the board. Um, it's in the least convenient location ever, but it's still there, right? It's 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 actually arguably less bad than the postcode under your last PCIe slot because at least, um, you know, when you have a motherboard where it's like it has a four-way GPU layout and the postcode is under the last PCIe slot, it's just like... Like, I can't help but facepalm because then it's like, yeah, I'm going to run multiple GPUs and I'm not going to be able to use any of the functionality on the board as a result of that. And here, you know, the, the main issue with this here is like you're going to have to like I'm used to having my test benches set up so that the rear I.O. is away from me. Um, so, yeah, th this basically just forces you to run your test bench in a different orientation so that you can actually see the postcode. But at least it's still there which uh, is, you know, is huge for a motherboard this small. Like, I, I'm, I'm really happy that they managed to keep that. And they've done the, the rear I.O. postcode in, on other impacts as well. I kind of wish um, that the postcode was... Uh, th well, basically, I kind of wish that they had, like, a... Oh, no, yeah, so the postcode's right here, and it's basically on a little, like, daughter board. Um, I really wish they had actually had that on like a connector with like an extension wire so you could just like take this and disconnect it from the rear IO and then just run it wherever you feel like but uh, I'm pretty sure that's just soldered directly into the board. So I guess if you were, you know, handy with uh, with desoldering you could try desolder that yourself and then build your own extension cable for it and hope that that works because yeah like honestly i'm i'm happy that the functions are there i'm not happy with the fact that they're on the rear io because the the thing is is just like your other functionality is down here and over here right so there's not really any optimal uh layout for this board if they had the power button on the rear io and maybe also the safe boot then i think like it'd be like okay i, I can live with that but on the rear I.O., like, you get the postcode, you get the reset, you get the clear CMOS, and you get the BIOS flashback. So it's just, like, you get some of the functions, not enough of them, in my opinion. So, yeah, not really, like, I understand that there's, like, the board's just not big enough to do anything significantly better than this, but this is just kind of, like... I, it's not very convenient to, to use all of the functions on this board is is basically what I'm getting at. But still, at least they're still there, right? Like that that's 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 way better than a lot of other small form factor boards where it's just like, oh, you want a postcode or troubleshooting LEDs? Yeah, we don't have those because there just wasn't enough space. Um, so yeah, anyway, so that kind of covers all of the the various uh, quality of li life for overclockers features. Right, because you can overclock without all of this. It's just much more painful to do. Um, 
anyway, let's move on to the VRM. And, well, it is uh, it is a four phase, which, uh, you know, everybody's going to be like, oh, no, it's got a low phase count. So the thing is, um, the thing about, like, so, yeah, we have a four phase here. So it's one, two, two, three, four phases. It's controlled by this chip right here. So that's an IR35201. And the thing about the, and, and that's running as a four plus two because we also have the two SOC phases up here. So that's our SOC, one and two. The power stages for that are on the back of the board. We'll get to that. But anyway, so the vCore VRM, um, it is a four phase, right? It looks like an eight, but it's a four because this controller does not go above eight phases total. So if you want to run a four plus two, well, you can't run an eight plus two off of it. So um, that's why this is a four phase. Now, uh, the thing about the low phase count is basically you get more input ripple, which Asus is already dealing with by having like there, there's top of the line X570 motherboards that have less input filtering capacitors than this does. Um, so yeah, like, you know, like the, the thing with the low phase count is just basically you get more input ripple, you get more output ripple, and there's ways to work around both of those things. And at least from the testing, like, you know, I've tested some X, uh, X570 Asus motherboards, which do this style of VRM configuration. Like Asus is really good about the sort of, you know, fixing all of the shortcomings of a low phase count. So it's really not a concern. Um, the main thing that's kind of worth noting about this is this is general, like this is a really cheap way to get a lot of power handling capability because the the thing is, is by running your, uh, you know, running the, the power stages in parallel, you still get the benefit of just having more low side, uh, a lower low side RDS on. So efficiency wise, this is very close to a real eight phase. It's not quite there because you don't have full current balancing between all of the power stages. Um, but it is, it gets very, very close to a full straight up eight phase. Right. So that, that's kind of the thing is just, uh, yeah, like for, for, an, and especially on a mini DTX board like this, um, I think this is actually a really clever way of solving the whole issue of, well, the other option was to use like an XDPE 132 G5C or another controller that supports more than eight phases, which Infineon now makes, uh, the, Infineon makes a 10 phase and they do make a 16 phase, right? With the XDPE 132 G5C. So if Asus really wanted to, they could have gone for a, for a higher phase count controller and still gotten like a, uh, an eight plus two phase configuration working here. But, uh, like, you know, if you're not going to go for the more expensive controller, this is like, you, you can work around the restrictions of a four phase, right? This is argue like, this is still kind of a cheaper way of do doing things than getting a new controller. Um, but the, like at the end of the day, like th this gives you the efficiency of an eight phase. And if we, were you know if if it weren't for the fact that the newer controller exists this is actually a really clever solution to the whole issue of like how do you get more uh power stages onto a mini itx motherboard um now admittedly there's also doublers which asus could have used for for an eight phase configuration but asus basically with their uh vrm design recently they're really pushing for like we want to have the best possible transient response um and uh well doublers are not you know, helpful in that department because they basically like the the main issue with the uh, transient response is basically how quickly can the voltage regulator uh, c control the actual power stages. And if you put a doubler between the power stages and the voltage uh, and the actual controller, then any, you know, signal that the controller sends to the power stages get arrives a little bit later. It's very it's a very small delay. It's like 10, uh, you know, 10 well, it depends on the, the transition in the signal, but basically some transitions might be as quick as five nanoseconds. Some of the longer ones, you're looking at like 30 nanoseconds of delay, um, which is not a lot. Um, and the end result is it barely makes any actual, like the, the impact it has on your transient response is like tens of millivolts. Um, so it's not very significant, but ASUS is just like, we are prioritizing transient response above everything, uh, above all else. Uh, and I guess they also benefit from the fact like, hey, you, you know, not having doublers saves money as well and space on the board. Um, so, you know, it's just like the, the, it's a four phase doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It just means, you it you know, Asus has different priorities with their VRM design than other board vendors. And in fact, like the, the thing is with this four phase right here, I'm actually like 
th this this is the best four phase ever. <laughs> and the reason why this is the best four phase ever is these chips right here. These are TDA uh, 21472s. And those are 70 amp smart power stages from Infineon. So these are ridiculously efficient. And of course, Asus is getting eight of them in parallel for the, the well, has eight of them for the V-Core. So the end result is that this eight phase, uh, well, this four phase has an absolutely inf insane efficiency, right? And then the other things is just like, yeah, they, they have more input filtering capacitors and that kind of thing. So they deal with that. Um, and actually on the output, your output ripple is not that much of a concern compared to the actual transient loading from the CPU. Um, and in that department, like ignoring the fact that like Asus doesn't use doublers, like I'm a big fan of SMD aluminum polymers, right? And um, actually anybody who's been on the channel for long enough probably is fully aware of this, but yeah, I'm a huge fan of SMD aluminum polymer capacitors. There is one downside to these. You can't get them in high endurance ratings, or at least I've not seen any in high endurance ratings because I, well, I did a quick search on DigiKey for aluminum polymers and I sorted them by highest endurance rating and they top out at like 2000 hours at 105 degrees. But you know, it's just like the cap, like the capacitors will still like the, they're a light, um, like straight up raw performance. They're superior to the through hole aluminum polymers and um, at least within their rated lifespan, right? Like that's kind of the thing. But the thing is, if you just have a VRM that doesn't run very hot in the first place, you don't need very high endurance capacitors. And that's where, uh, that's where the TDA 21472s really help this, this VRM out is just like, like, like I'm a fan of this, um, you know, like, it's it's the most epic four phase ever and admittedly like you know asus could have probably managed to do an eight phase and it wouldn't have, like if they went for an xdp like one of the new infineon controllers they could have done an eight phase but i'm willing to tolerate this <laughs> okay like i'm willing to tolerate this so let's talk uh efficiency figures stupid webcam controls why are you covering up my notes there we go um, finally need to use them. So, um, for 1.2 volts output, 400 kilohertz switching frequency, and, uh, 5 volts drive voltage, which is literally the only voltage that these power stages run. Well, no, you could overvolt them, it's just bad for their lifespan, so, you know, don't do that. So, they're supposed to run on 5 volts, and they run on, on 5 volts best. So, 100 amp output, this VRM is going to be producing only 8 watts of heat. Like, these have an insanely high peak efficiency and yeah at 100 amps output they're very much at the peak of their efficiency curve so um yeah th this board actually i think for 100 amps output is one of the most efficient boards out there because on a lot of like say on some of the other say like a gigabyte x570 uh, extreme that motherboard has so much like if that board is outputting 100 amps for peak efficiency you'd actually want to turn off basically half the vrm Right, like, that's the thing is just like half the VRM shouldn't be running if your priority is to just get peak efficiency. Um, so yeah, anyway, this board, you don't actually need to turn off any phases because it hits peak efficiency exactly at pretty much 100 amps output. Now 150 amps output, um, it'll produce about 11 watts of heat, which again, like the absolutely insane efficiency figures. Like these, these power stages are freaking awesome. Like, pretty much the best power, like, th those are pretty much the best 70 amp smart power stages you can currently get. Um, 200 amps output, you're going to be looking at about uh, 16, that's insane. Like, yeah, ba basically through in throughout this entire load range, like, this thing is, you know, at the top of its uh, efficiency figures. Um, and then it starts finally dropping off at around, you know, 300 amps output, it, it starts... Uh, not well actually 300 amps amp output it's still doing really really well um, like honestly this is a if this was a like the the thing is this VRM at least on paper in terms of efficiency figures is like better than what you get on most ATX motherboards um, including some of the high-end ones it's just like Honestly, like the 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 insane, like having the say the twelve phase of sixty amp power stages or a twelve phase of fifties or a twelve phase like or a or a seven phase with two sixty amp power stages in parallel per phase, like honestly, very unnecessary. You could just run this as an eight phase, 
um, and and you would basically get the same efficiency figures, um, and, and you should still you you should be getting roughly the same efficiency figures. So, yeah, th this VRM right here is just absolutely freaking insane. Um, but it does drop off eventually at 400 amps output. Um, you know, it starts producing about 48 watts of heat, whereas there are some motherboards that manage to do 400 amps output at 40 watts of of heat. So. The thing is, also with a lot of the other boards, like you'd actually be running phase shedding, and like a lot of the uh, like ATX high end boards basically would be disabling bits and pieces of the VRM to get better efficiency in this load range. Whereas this board just kind of nails its efficiency curve for that that entire uh, section, even up to 300 amps. Like basically, good rule of thumb: if you can just chop off the zero, and that's roughly your heat output, then the VRM is great. <laughs> so. Yeah, anyway, um, for a small form factor board, you're basically not going to see a better VRM than this um, because of those, like, yeah, 70 amp smart power stages from Infineon. They're, they're just absolutely insane. So, you know, power, like, the basically this V-Core VRM, the only thing you could complain about is the relatively low phase count, and there's ways to work around that. Um, and Asus is very good at those. So... Yeah, um, I'm 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 a huge fan of the V core on this. Like, yeah, you know, if if more like if more motherboards did this, I, I would be totally okay with that. So, um, yeah, so that's the V core VRM, um, and it, that it's one hell of a V core. And then of course we also have the superior output filtering capacitors, and just like like I'd really love to see the like honestly I wouldn't be surprised if this outperformed say the crosshair eight crosshair eight hero and formula on transient response like or well no i wouldn't be i really wouldn't be because it's the same controller right Th this is, these are arguably better power stages um i would really yeah i would not be surprised if this actually had a transient response advantage over the the hero or the formula um because it also has like the, the capacitor configuration on the output is just better um, so yeah, um, though there are some, like the, the thing is actually high phase count VRMs do have some inherent benefits to their transient response as well. Um, but the thing is modern voltage control, but that's for like slower transients. They have advantages because for really fast transients, all of your modern voltage controllers will actually enter, like they'll stop running the VRM in a sort of like, cause normally you'll just run all four phases interleaved for steady state. But modern high-end controllers will actually um, potentially run multiple, like turn on multiple phases at the same time when you really need to get a lot of current to the output quickly. So instead of running, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, which is what you'd normally see in steady state, you might have, uh, you know, one is already turned on and then it's like, oh, we need more current, two turns on, three turns on, four turns on at the same time. And uh, the controller would, will then sort of dynamically uh, turn, like, it basically will not run in the usual control scheme. And that's why also, like, getting rid of the doublers helps with that, because it means the controller can do fancy PWM manipulation tricks like that much, much faster, because they're not going to be delayed towards the, not going to be delayed towards the, uh, towards the power stages. So... Yeah, um, but there are, like, the, the thing is, if you have a seven phase, then you never, like, the because the, the potential issue with a four phase is basically you have periods of time when none of the phases is turned on. Whereas with a seven phase pushing, say, 1.3 volts output, you're always going to have at least one phase. Well, is it? No, seven phase is still going to have, is still not going to be full overlap. But basically, with a high enough phase count, you get into a situation where you're never going to have any, like, at full, if the whole VRM is running, right? Because obviously, if you're at idle, then the whole VRM isn't running. Because uh, <laughs> that would be really inefficient. But if the whole VRM is running, um, you do get a little bit of benefit, uh, with a really high phase count, you get a little bit of benefit from the fact that for uh, load insertion transients, you're not going to have a you're basically going to have at least one phase already turned on. So you're not going to get like the initial dip in the voltage is not going to be as drastic as it would be if you have all of your phases turned off, which regularly happens on a four phase, right? Because each phase is running at, um, you know, if you're going for a 1.3 volts output, each phase is going to be running, say, 10, 12% duty cycle. So, you know, if you add that up, that's like 48, 48%. Uh, 48%. So basically, 
half the time, none of the phases are on. And if your transient occurs when none of the phases are on, uh, your voltage falls off a cliff. Uh, like, your voltage will drop more than if it happens while a phase is already on. Um, so, yeah, because basically then you're just waiting for the controller to, to switch the phases on as quickly as possible. But, yeah, um, so there are, like, benefits to having a ton of phases. Um, when it comes to transient response. Um, but those tend to taper off at around 10. And going past 10, you don't really see any advantages anymore. Um, so, well, it depends on the output voltage you're aiming for. But going past 10, generally, you're not going to see benefits because you like you need to be running less than like 1.2 volts output um, for that kind of... Uh, for, for advantages at uh, higher phase counts than that. Um... So, yeah, but nonetheless, like, th this VRM right here, like, I'd be very interested to see its transient response performance, because it, on paper, it looks freaking awesome. Um, and I don't think the fact that it has a low phase count would actually have that much of it, like, well, I'm not sure how much of an impact it would have, because I've not, like, done any testing where you take the exact same VRM twice, and then you run it once as a, uh, as a 16 phase, and then once as an 8. Okay, like, I've not actually done any tests like that, but if you look at the, like, if you, well, whatever. Worst case scenario for load insertion transient is while the phases are off, which with a four phase, it happens pretty regularly. Um, so, yeah, but the thing is, is also if the controller can respond fast enough and your capacitor bank is good enough, then it's just like, well, you could actually sort of, like, you can work around that as well, right? So... Anyway, let's move on from the V-Core VRM because, you know, if we want to put it simply, this is really bloody good. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of the V-Core on this board. And really in ITX, like for, for this form factor, you're not really going to find a better VRM anyway because it's not like any of them has a 10 phase, right? Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they, like, actually like this should straight up outperform a lot of ATX boards and it might be... It could very well be like top three for transient response or top four um, across the entire X570 motherboard lineup. So, yeah. Anyway, um, let's move on from the vCore VRM to the SOC VRM. So, the SOC VRM is more TDA 21472s. Those are on the back of the board right here. Um, and, you know, you might be kind of concerned about like, well, how, how do th those get cooled? And, well, there's this. Oops. I'm on the wrong layer. There we go. Um, yeah, you have this plate right here. Now, unfortunately, the heat pipe only goes over the V-Core VRM. And I am not sure how effect... Like, the, the thing is, is like, yeah, okay, the heat pipe is nice, but there's not really any... Cert like, the, I guess... Well, no, I guess it does benefit in that you basically... Because if you didn't have the heat pipe, what would basically happen is like, you know, the heat would maybe spread through like this portion of the plate, and there's obviously no plate right here, so basically you just get this acting as a heat sink. Whereas with the heat pipe, they can spread the heat out over a bit more surface area, so, you know, you might get a... If you actually took an IR camera to the heat back plate, you might see something that looks like that, rather than without the heat pipe, you wouldn't really see that. So, I guess they might be effectively close to, like, doubling the uh, useful surface area of the back plate for the V-Core VRM cooling. Um, and uh, for the SOC VRM, they, they have this right here. And that thermal pad looks like it's out of alignment, which is a bit concerning. But luckily, the SOC VRM really doesn't go under that much load. Um, the main issue with the SOC VRM on this motherboard is that it's on the back of the board where there's barely any airflow. So that's why they really need to sink it into the, into the backplate, because the actual power stages themselves really don't produce, like, they're still TDA21472s. Oops, sorry. Um... But the, the thing is, is the, like, the SOC VRM is not really going to push anything more than, like, say, 20, maybe 40 amps at most. And actually, 40 amps would be really pushing it. Um, and the VRM should still produce, like, less than 4 watts of heat at that kind of output. Um, which, you know, if those power stages were on the front of the board and not jammed right next to each other, uh, they would probably be capable of dissipating that completely just passively on their own without even a, uh, even any heatsink. But since they're on the back of the board where you're, you're like, that's a cramped location, there's very little airflow, if not zero airflow, uh, you do actually need to, you know, add some surface area to, to get better, better heat dissipation. The thing is, uh, it is worth noting that also, of course, the 
the board itself actually acts as a heatsink as well. So like the inductors are a, you know, those are bas basically just straight up blocks of metal with a direct uh, copper connection straight to the like largest pads of the power stages. So these are going to act as great heat sinks as well. Um, and, and the PCB will actually act as a heat sink as well for the SOCVRM. And the SOCVRM here is really freaking powerful and efficient. So um, it, it's actually, I think you don't, I don't think there's a single board with a, well, no, I think ASRock has some four phase. Oh no, no, that was in the past. For X570, I think this might be the most powerful. And uh, nope, there's the godlike. I've forgotten about that one. <laughs> yes, the godlike has a more overkill uh, SOCVRM as far as raw power is concerned. But uh, as uh, but still, it's like the godlike is like insane overkill. This is already uh, very, very overkill. Like you can do, you know, you can use significantly less substantial SOCVRMs and still get perfectly good thermals on them. So yeah, here the main issue is just like, there's no airflow behind a board. So yeah, that, that's that's why they're sinking some of the heat into the back plate, um, even though some of the heat will obviously be cooled through the actual front of the board as well. So yeah, um, so VRM wise, I'm, I'm like a huge fan of this motherboard. Like <laughs> honestly, uh, they're, like this is one of the reasons why I said this is for me, this board is one of the top two X570 motherboards because it's just like you get a great VRM, you get all of the extreme overclocking features, including uh, only one DIMM for each memory channel, right? Which uh, th this this can significantly help when just pushing raw maximum memory frequency. So that's the other thing that really I'm a fan of with this board um, is just like, yeah, you have less uh, DIMM slots, which should mean uh, better memory overclocking. And also Asus uh, with the mini DTX uh, form factor, they see, well, the, the thing is, is just like, I, I'd like to say that they're, they're keeping their memory section relatively free of garbage, but garbage in the memory section. Now, admittedly, this is an eight layer PCB. So, you know, it's like using, like, I don't know how much, like, I, I, I don't know how it's actually laid out, but <laughs> there are ATX eight layer PCB boards where you just like, there's nothing there. Um, and then Asus is just like, yeah, let's, let's stick the RGB controller there. But we've already seen some overclocking results with this board, which are, which seem to be really impressive for memory. So yeah, I'm not sure like I don't I don't think this is actually that harmful, but I I'm not a fan of that being there. Um anyway, for the memory uh output filter, we're actually looking at a whole bunch of tantalum capacitors. And uh it's kind of interesting that normally most boards would actually prioritize putting them right up here, but the memory power plane basically looks typically looks something like this. So your memory VRM is up here. And the power plane basically goes like that. So it also goes to the memory controller. So it normally, like, I assume it's laid out something like this. And it actually extends all the way down to here. I, there, there's some VDIM pins down down here. I don't think there's... Down here you have VPP. So I don't think VDIM's down there as well. But yeah, so it's kind of your memory memory power delivery. So it's kind of interesting that they have all of, like, the most, most of their bulk capacitance is actually closer to the memory controller than the actual memory VRM itself. Um, but... Yeah, like, you know, it's going to be fine. There, There's motherboards which actually basically go with just one capacitor, and then it's like, yeah, that's that's enough. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a, the, the memory power uh, power delivery also looks fine, um, as far as I'm concerned. And that's this VRM up here. And I'm actually not sure on the component specs, but it really, like, DDR4 really doesn't pull that much power, so it doesn't matter that much. Um, the other benefit DDR4 has is that it's normally powered off of like five volts instead of 12. So the duty cycle that that VRM runs at is significantly higher. And since it runs at a higher duty cycle, you actually like in a, say a vCore VRM, your big problem is that you're basically pushing 90% of the current through the low side MOSFET, which means that your high side MOSFET is like, is kind of like, it's basically wasting space and, you know, adding cost to the design that like you really don't want. Um, cause it's not like that MOSFET isn't really doing, isn't actually doing that much work. Um, whereas in a memory VRM where you can run it off of five volts, um, your high side MOSFET is handling significantly more of the current. So you can actually use, uh, so, so the, basically the loading is better spread out and you can use a, uh, sort of more balanced MOSFET design. Cause usually in like in a, in a vCore VRM, you might have like a one milliohm RDS on low side and then like a five milliohm RDS on high side. Whereas in a, 
in a memory VRM, you can look at like two, say three milliohms on both sides and it'll actually work much, like it'll work really well. Um, because the low side isn't handling so much of the current on its own. So yeah, anyway, that's the memory VRM jammed up here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, like the, I like the, the memory configuration here looks, looks great. Um, it's probably like, especially since like Asus does put a lot of memory, uh, well, a lot of effort into their memory, uh, memory capabilities. And I know they have this fancy marketing stuff right here. I don't actually care about that. Like th this is literally just a fancy marketing name for we actually put effort into our memory layout <laughs> with these boards. But the thing is, most board vendors put some amount of effort into their memory layout and uh, memory overclocking, or at least it kind of depends on the motherboard, right? Like sometimes you have motherboards even from, you know, well, say Asus or ASRock or, uh, or MSI. Well, yeah, I think MSI has, has had a few boards where... Well, I've not had that many MSI boards in the past, but like there's some gigabyte boards which are just atrocious and it's basically because something went wrong with the memory layout and it's just like, yeah, there's there's like a timing that for some reason needs to be absurdly high or you can't l run low command rate, which really like I, like that, that, that a lot of the time is just kind of like, you know, if you do uh, a, a lot of the time, just the ability to do 1T command rate as a very large range of frequencies is a combination of like trace layout and also BIOS, uh, BIOS settings. But um, physically, memory the, the memory section of this board looks absolutely freaking great. And I would only assume that the BIOS is also, you know, tuned well for memory overclocking. So yeah, um, physically, this board basically is everything you could want from an overclocking X570 motherboard, except maybe that the form factor kind of sucks, <laughs> right? But this is the this is one of the, the issues when it comes to sort of building extreme overclocking motherboards or just motherboards. Like the thing is, even at ambient, this thing is probably going to be better at memory overclocking than like 99%, if not 100% of X570 motherboards. Um, the thing is, is just like, building a motherboard that's really great at memory overclocking, you have to use one DIMM per channel. The thing is, if you do that on an ATX board, most people don't want to buy those because it's perceived as a loss of features, which in a lot of cases it can be because, um, you know, a lot of like a lot of people don't care about max frequency and lowest possible timings on a 2x8 configuration, especially with a platform like, uh, you know, X570, where it's like, I want to run a 3950X or a 3900X, which is basically a workstation class CPU. And it's just like, yeah, if you run a 3950X or a 3900X, you might want to run like 32 or even 64 gigs of RAM. And in that scenario, you really, really want, like you don't want to be stuck with a two dim board because it makes uh, running those mem high density memory configurations a bit more awkward because you're basically like you're, well, actually two by 16 dims work really well with AMD's memory controller. Um, but with say on Intel platforms, two by 16 has kind of flaky support from the board vendors because the board vendors have a lot more control over there. Um, but uh, yeah, like, so, so the thing is, is just like, you know, like personally, I would be a huge fan if this board was like MATX or ATX and, you know, still kept the same memory configuration, maybe slightly altered the VRM. Um, I would, I really want to keep the same capacity. Like the thing is, if this got, became an ATX board, I'm a hundred percent certain that all of the, the SMD capacitors would immediately get swapped out with through hole aluminum polymers. And I'd be extremely disappointed about that. Um, unintentional benefits of ITX motherboards is that they get better capacitors than everything else, at least from a raw electrical performance perspective. If you, you know, if you worry about like the, the thing is you can't get these rated at like 10,000 hours or something. The thing is, I like just don't have, if the VRM doesn't run hot, you don't need capacitors rated for 10,000 hours at 105 degrees because your 2000 hours at 105 degrees rated capacitors, if you run them at 60 are going to last for freaking ever. Right. So that's kind of the thing. Um, just, uh, just, just build a better VRM and then use better <laughs> than, then use the, then you don't need to use high endurance capacitors. But anyway, so yeah, like basically what I'm getting at is I'm a huge fan of this motherboard and, uh, I don't know why I went off track about the, mem like the memory thing, but, um, uh, yeah, if, if it was ATX, like I, li literally the only things I would want is more PCIe slots. And for the, 
you know, those functions to be jammed in the top right corner over here. That's literally the only two changes I would make to this board. Um, if, you know, it was to get bigger. Um, and maybe, maybe it might make sense to, like, shift the SOC VRM power stages up top and add a phase to the V-Core. You know, just one. One more. <laughs> um, and, uh... Yeah, but other like, still, it's just like as far as X five seventy motherboards, like this is a top two. For me, this is a top two motherboard. Um, if not, like in in some ways, this could very easily be a top one motherboard. Like you know, the very best motherboard for like memory or or uh, well, transient response. Nah, it could be. It could very easily end up being the very best for transient response as well. Um, so, yeah. Huge fan of this board right here. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for the video, I guess. It's 40 minutes long, so good job, me. It's actually not that bad. I was worried this would go for an hour because anytime I, I, I deal with a motherboard where it's like, I love every single inch of it, um, which admittedly, well, now, the, 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 this right here, I couldn't care less about. And that right there, I, I couldn't care less about either. <laughs> but everything else, I'm a huge, huge fan of. But yeah, the, the thing is, is just like do, doing boards like this is like, I'm always worried that I'll like not, uh, what is it, not do the board justice, right? If I'm looking at a motherboard that's really nice, it's like, how, how do I explain to people why it's so freaking nice? And it's just like, well, ho I feel like I've done a good job with this one. So yeah. Uh, oh, wait, we forgot to take a look at the cooling system. Honestly, yeah. Well, here's your cooling system. There's a fan for the chipset over here. There's a fan for the V-Core VRM over there. We actually have some, you know, we have some rather thin fins uh, in here. But the thing is, like, the funny thing about actually VRM heatsink design is this style of fin really doesn't work if you don't force air through it because it's way too dense for, uh, like, it's a little bit too dense for uh, passive operation because, like, uh heat transfer by convection, which is the whole hot air rises thing, is actually really inefficient because hot air rises really slowly. So, um, yeah, but w when you strap a fan to it, like, it should ro work really, really well. And actually, I I'm surprised that Asus didn't try to go for a full passive V-Core because I think they could have probably actually pulled it off. Like, I'm not, like, with how efficient these power stages are on paper, um, this should have, like, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, uh, well, maybe they couldn't have gotten the aesthetic that they wanted with that such a heatsink, but I would not be surprised if you could could run a completely passive heatsink for the VRM here. The chips, uh, I'm not so sure about, right? But the VRM, yeah, especially considering where they put the chips at, right? There's no space for, actually, no, they could have put, like, a really tall... Uh, passive heatsink that's like basically as well that might encroach on the CPU like CPU heatsink compatibility um, and maybe also their dim dot two thing over here I'm so dim dot two thing over there but still um, yeah the VRM cool like the thing is once you strap a fan to a VRM your heatsink requirements become much lower because forced airflow is so much more airflow than what you get from convection that like yeah, the, this the, this VRM cooling system right here should have absolutely no problem dealing with the heat output of this VRM. Like, it, it should have no problem. So, um, yeah, that that's it. That's that's everything I want to say about the the amazing and kind of adorable Crosshair 8 Impact because it's small. Um, and yeah, that's it for the video. So thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Uh, like, share, subscribe. Also, thank you to the fan of the channel who actually sent these pictures in. Um, they, uh, work, they're, they're great. Yeah. Like pictures like this are exactly what I need. And, uh, um, what else was there? Right. Thank you to, to him. Already told you to do all the YouTube things, right? If you'd like to support me, uh, and what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon where you can support me directly. And I also have a Teespring where you can buy like AHOC themed merch. Um, there's links to both down in the description below and they help out with running the channel immensely. So yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.